Hey, what's going on? It's your boy Sintel with the Intel. And this time of year, everybody puts together their top 10 list. Well, my top 10 lists are going to be for the best Marvel projects in 2021. And spoiler alert, Spider-Man No Way Home is not number one on my list. Stay tuned. But before we get started, make sure you hit that subscription button and click the bell icon so that you can get up to date notifications anytime something new like this drops, man. Anytime I get these lists, you could be in the know and kicking it with your boy. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get this started. Coming in at number 10 is The Falcon and Winter Soldier. Now, this is what I don't understand. This is a story about a dude who, for the majority of the show, tries to convince himself that he's worthy of holding the mantle of Captain America. Dog, you fought Thanos. Nobody needs to tell you you're worthy of carrying the shield. One of the goods is that we get a chance to look at how some of these cinematic fight scenes can look on the regular home Disney Plus sit at home version. You know, it's, uh, some of this stuff is kind of difficult to do unless you're like Daredevil. Daredevil has some of the best fight scenes ever, but generally speaking on TV, it's kind of tough to kind of get that done. The bad and the ugly of it is that it's, it's just, tough to kind of get over the fact that Falcon doesn't believe that he's worthy of being Captain America. And that's like the main thing that it kind of like hinges on. And then he gives this speech at the end of it that just didn't hit the mark for me. Coming in at number nine is The Eternals. This story is about a movie that should have been a series on Disney Plus. Giant man lives inside of the planet and nobody seems to notice. So Okay, sure. I think if this was like a 10 part series, even an eight part series, it could have done really well. Big shout out to Chloe Zhao, who uh, was a first time director on a massive budgeted Marvel film. And, and they hired her for a really good reason because they want to try and switch up how the storytelling is done for these superhero movies. Um, I just think it just needed a little bit more, more refinement, a little bit more work. Uh, we were hoping to get a chance to get some bigger reveals in the end. I'm trying not to have too much of a spoiler, but uh, here's a bit of a spoiler. There's a guy that lives on the planet. Nobody seems to notice. And here's another gripe that I had. It's small, but it's my gripe, damn it. And I'm going to go ahead and express it. Yo, the lady that was the speedster, uh, it was, she had a very interesting character because she was deaf. Um, but my problem with is not that I have a problem with people that, that have, uh, that have handicaps. My problem is that you're an eternal in a spacecraft that has these insane amounts of technology and they couldn't figure out how to cure your deafness. I, that, it just kind of just, it kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, yeah, you fast and all, but yo, this dude is making spaceships out of just twiddling his fingers together. And I, I just didn't buy that part. Coming in at number eight, what if? This show should have been really called, what if Tony Stark's died like this? What if Tony Stark's died like that? Hey, I got a great way that we can kill Tony Stark's. Nice little series. As a kid, I used to love the comic books and checking them out. I thought it was gonna be a little bit like that. They're all gonna be a bit of one-offs, but what really happened and what we ultimately find out is that these stories are a part of canon. Now, this is a good thing and it's also a bad thing. It's a good thing because it makes you really invested in every single episode. The bad thing is how it kind of does it because there is a character in particular, Black Widow, who is dead, but is back alive in What If, and now she's possibly back in the canon. I don't know how that's going to work. To go back to one of my dislikes with bringing back Black Widow, it just totally undermines the stakes, right? Because if anybody can be brought back and you can just go to any random dimension and pick up a version of somebody that's died in the MCU, then, you know, it's like, well, what's the point? Speaking of Black Widow, coming in at number seven is Black Widow, the movie. If there ever was a project that embodied the opening sequence of Saving Private Ryan for a movie premiere during the time of COVID, this would be it. Although it made a profit, it showed the rest of the movie world that the streets weren't ready for it just yet. One of my favorite movies is Saving Private Ryan because of the opening sequence. And that opening sequence is they drop the doors and the very first Marines that hit the beach just get absolutely annihilated. And they show you how grisly and how horrible this moment is. That's what I thought of when I saw Black Widow for the first time, because the bullets in the streets was those COVID vaccine molecules and they were firing like nobody's business. And anybody that was stepping outside of their house was getting hit. That was a huge detriment 
to being one of Marvel's first cinematic experiences in the movie theater. Nobody really came to show up. Now that is a really good excuse for maybe people not enjoying Black Widow the way that it should have been, but the movie was still kind of ho-hum anyways. It was still a lot of fun though, regarding like the spectacle, the, the prison break scene was really good. Uh, the overall story regarding waking up all of the, the sleeper cell Black Widows was interesting to a point as well. But to me, it was all about uh, Yelena, who was Black Widow's sister per se, having her be the next to kind of like hold the reins as as the Black Widow, the moniker of the, of the, the Lady Assassins. And those moments when she's showing her, her, her posing moments just made me really excited to see her in the future because we know that she's coming. And spoiler alert, if you are uh, watching Hawkeye, she does make an appearance. And when she does, it's like, oh my gosh, she's this really fun character. And she absolutely kills it and Hawkeye as well. Real talk, I actually feel kind of bad for Black Widow because I think it was the lowest grossing Marvel film since the MCU got started. And that's just not necessarily just because of the content. It just was wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, like really you stormed the beaches of Normandy and just took one for the team. Uh, so much so that it kind of changes the way the rest of Hollywood was looking at how they were going to do these releases and kind of push forward the idea of doing these streaming services like HBO Max and Disney Plus to show some of these movie premieres uh, instead of just posting them out and risking it all like they did for Black Widow. Ah, uh, rest in peace, Black Widow. Coming in at number six, Venom, There Will Be Carnage. And this is what happens when post credit scenes actually get more publicity and more burn than the actual movie itself. Nobody really talked about Venom, There Will Be Carnage. Everybody was talking about the post credit scene because all of the hype that No Way Home was getting. Uh, I will say this about Venom though, I thought it was better than the first one. It turned into like this bromance between a symbiote alien and this poor schmuck that just <laughs> trying to kind of do the right thing. Uh, the bad and ugly of, of this film is, I don't even know if this is fully on bad, but it is one of the very first ones to really step in and open up the Spider-Verse, Sony's Spider-Verse. And there is a really good teaser slash spoiler uh, that's at the end of it where it's revealed that there could be a collaboration with the MCU. Now, I'm hoping that the MCU writers stay on board because them writing on behalf for a Venom show would be really good. But then if you watch No Way Home and at the end of their trailer, uh, you kind of get that candy snatched back from out of your hands, that that joy, because um, the characters kind of disappear out of the out of the MCU. And you don't really know what's going to happen with it. Coming in at number five, WandaVision. It starts off pretty interesting. A lot of black and white references to old TV shows that millennials probably do not understand. Why? Because their parents are probably not even old enough to understand a lot of this. Uh, WandaVision starts off pretty good. It's got some really cool, interesting characters that could have their own spinoffs as well. Uh, and then you get a chance to get introduced into who is arguably one of the craziest people in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and kind of turn her into somebody that you can feel bad for, which is interesting to me because of the atrocities that Wanda Maximoff is capable of doing. And hopefully we'll be able to see that maybe in the next Doctor Strange movie or later on. There's three characters in the show that I would love to see a spinoff that we're probably not gonna see. Um, and that's uh, Darcy Lewis, Jimmy Woo, and Monica Rambeau. The three of them together would have been a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely could not stand about it was the teasing of Quicksilver. How are you gonna do me like that? Like you gonna bring Quicksilver in and then not really it be Quicksilver? Nah, just, you're doing too much. Probably not, not with what I think is going to happen with the Scarlet Witch, but if they do bring it back, I'm hoping that they don't do the TV show part anymore. It was fun for like the first episode and then it got really old afterwards. Coming in at number four, yo, we are almost there, ladies and gentlemen, Loki. Yes, this is yet another story about Karen's Gone Wild when a Loki variant wants to speak to the manager only to discover that the black guy running the place is about to quit anyways. It was tons of fun dealing with what is an impossible task, multiverses. How do you traverse multiverses? If there's one way to make it fun, putting in a Marvel film and having a bunch of cool, semi bad guys try to work it out, 
works out. Uh, some of the things that really stand out is I want a series spinoff from Miss Minutes and maybe from Frog and Alligator Loki as well. That was a lot of fun. Marvel is doing a lot of passing on the baton to new, newer versions of older characters um, to phase out the, the, the next reinstatement of the MCU. And we are introduced into a variant version of Loki. Um, she is an interesting character. She's just not as as fun as Tom Hiddleston's version of, of Loki. Uh, maybe if we see some more of her, and I think we may see her in some more of the cinematic universe as well, uh, I can change my mind. I am absolutely open uh, to be changed. But as of right now, nobody's beating Tom Hiddleston's version of, of Loki. Uh, the bad is, yo, we really messed up the Marvel Universe with uh, all of these variations of, of the multiverse. Um, I had this problem uh, earlier when we were talking about Black Widow being brought back. Uh, the problem with this is that it eliminates stakes. If there's always gonna be a variant or a version of somebody that you can bring back to replace it, then when somebody gets killed, you're kind of like, eh, whatever, we'll just bring in Earth 255's version of this person and then we can just keep the story moving. Don't be surprised if they don't if they bring a, a Tony Stark's back because now that there's a multiverse, Coming in at number three is Shang-Chi. Made sure I said that correctly, Shang-Chi. This was the little engine that could. This project was so proud of itself that they made an entire scene just so that you could say the name correctly, Shang-Chi. I have to admit, I didn't expect it to be this good. Some of the fight scenes were, were completely legendary. Some of the best cinematic hand-to-hand -hand combat fight scenes that I had seen since Winter Soldier. Uh, of course, the legendary Daredevil series did some really good, did a really good job uh, with some of the fight scenes as well. But the ones in Shang-Chi, they just really stepped up. Uh, so huge shout out to Destin, uh, Destin Daniel Creighton, the, the director of Shang-Chi. There was an interview where he said, uh, one of the things that he made sure he did was kind of step out of the way and let people that were film creators, people that do special effects, people that do fight choreography, cinematography, and all of that, give them a general idea of what he wants done and then kind of just step out of the way and then let them create. And that is why you see some of the best of the best regarding the cinematics, regarding the acting, regarding some of the fight scenes and the action sequences. It is top notch. It's head and shoulders above any other of the cinematic experiences regarding fight scenes with the exception of maybe Hawkeye. Maybe, I don't know, I still think shang is number one. Excuse me, Shang-Chi. Now coming in at number two, and this is where the controversy starts. Woo, Spider-Man. No Way Home is my number two. Yes, yes, I know people are saying it is the greatest Spider-Man movie of all time. Yes, yes, I know people are saying it is the greatest MCU movie of all time. I do not agree. Not only do I not think it is the greatest MCU film of all time, I don't even think it's the greatest Spider-Man film of all time. I still think Into the Spider-Verse still holds the crown. Now live action, yeah, I can work with you on that. But Spider-Man in general, nah, nah. Now, hear me out. Once you get past the nostalgia, seeing all of the multiple Spider-Man and all of the multiple bad bad guys and stuff, and you and you're relying and you're relying strictly on the story, it's not as amazing as you may think it is. The whole premise of we're just gonna make people forget is kind of silly when. All you had to do was walk up to Dr. Strange and say, hey, Dr. Strange, how about we make people forget Mysterio? Roll credits, problem solved. But I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's a very good movie. It's a fantastic movie. I think it is the best cinematic experience of 2021. Cinematically, there's somebody else that's going to hold the throne, but it was fun. I do want to see uh, Garfield get a spinoff maybe somewhere in the Sony Spider-Verse where we can see another version of Amazing Spider-Man 3. I would also like to see maybe Tobey Maguire get brought back to kind of like maybe coach up Miles if they ever do decide to do a live action Miles. Um, it's worthy of the throne. It's, it's obviously worthy. It's already grossed over a billion dollars in like 12 days. It is must see, but it is not number one. I'll tell you which one is. The good, bad, and ugly regarding Spider-Man. Uh, the good, man, is probably one of the most aggressive and 
coolest ca- uh, marketing campaigns I've seen in quite some time. I think the biggest part of the buzz didn't come from the trailers and anything that Sony did. It just came from social media. Uh, everybody with, with sneak leaked footage, which more than likely <laughs> the studio probably leaked themselves. Everybody will know if Garfield was going to be in it. Everybody's going to know if, uh, if Toby was going to be in it, which villain was going to be in it. You know, it was just this whole thing and it just kept snowballing and snowballing. And even when they were releasing trailers, uh, they wouldn't show you how many Spider-Man there were or all of the villains per se. They let us do all of the heavy lifting for them. Some of my problems that I did have was the flimsy story. You know, the whole make me forget that just that just. No. <laughs> uh, the villains fell a little short as well. I, I loved Doc Ock, and of course I loved Green Goblin, but you know, Sandman was kind of pointless. Uh, Electro was just kind of meh, and we don't even really discuss Lizard. Like, was he even, why was he even in the film to begin with? I'm nitpicking. Keep in mind, I like the film. I think it's good, but it's just not number one. All right, coming in for number one, and this is where I'm gonna get all of my hate mail for the best Marvel projects coming out in 2021. And my number one, Hawkeye, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Hawkeye, the most obscure Marvel character <laughs> in the MCU is arguably the, the best project. Why? Because it gave me exactly what I was looking for. That is just a good old fashioned superhero story. Now, why are you asking me why Hawkeye is my favorite? Well, it's simple. It sticks to the basics. It's a very good superhero story that doesn't rely on gimmicks. It doesn't rely on multiverses. It doesn't rely on, on social issues, social constructs of trying to overcome this, that, and the third. There is a time and a place for that, and I'm not mad and upset for those that went and used the, went that route in order to tell their superhero story. But for me, I just wanted a good old fashioned superhero story. Not only did I get it, I got the mentor to mentee story. The young lady playing the new Hawkeye, Haley Stansfield, is absolutely killing the killing it like she she's got the moves she's got the look the acting is great she's connecting with with jeremy renner in a way that i wasn't expecting me i get my, i'm getting my buddy cop story that i was kind of kind of looking for uh with winter soldier and falcon um it's just a lot of fun it's technically a christmas show Technically, hey, if Die Hard can be a Christmas movie, this can be a Christmas series as well. The fight scenes are great. Uh, we get introduced into more interesting characters later on. Uh, I don't want to get into too many of the spoilers uh, regarding some that may lead into the Daredevil universe. Um, uh, it's just a lot of just meat that was on the bone of this. And it was fun. You know, it was just tons of fun. Um, and every single episode really hit the mark uh, as far as series go. I think they had a gem. I think I loved it also. A lot of it has to do is because I didn't see it coming. I would have never said Hawkeye would have been the winner for my 2021 if you had asked me a year ago. Um, that just goes to show you like the pride and dedication that the Disney franchise in the Marvel Universe is putting into telling these stories. I don't know how all of this is going to fit into the grand cinematic uni universe of everything, but of all of the new additions that we've seen, uh, that's including like the, the, the new Loki, that's including uh, Falcon uh, getting the throne, that's in, including Carnage being uh, invited into the, into the cinematic space as well. Um, uh, the, the new Black Widow, uh, uh, the one that I'm the most excited for uh, is Haley's uh, portrayal of, of her version of Hawkeye. She's fun. She's light. She's good. Um, and I absolutely endorse her as the new Hawkeye. I don't want Jeremy Renner to go either because he's doing a really good job. But, you know, Marvel's cleaning house. They're doing out with the old and in with the new. You know, Haley is my Hawkeye. So that's gonna conclude my top 10. I know you're frothing at the mouth and you're like, how could you not put Spider-Man as number one? Yeah, I can't believe you did Hawkeye, really? Hawkeye was my five. Hawkeye's number one. Watch it, it's really good, it's worth it. If you wanna be mad and complain, be mad and complain in the comments. Yo, you don't have to give me your whole 10. You can, give me your top five, give me your top three. I know everybody's gonna put Spider-Man cause that's what everybody loves. And yes, I did like Spider-Man. But no, it ain't number one. 
<laughs> all right with that being said yo it's your boy Sintel with the intel thank you for hanging out make sure you hit that subscription button click the bell icon for up-to-date notifications so that you can get all these new lists hey i hope everybody's having a great holiday and let me know how you feel all right i'll let you peace